Um, welcome everyone to our Copenhagen 2021 BOS. A big thank you to Copenhagen 2021 for the opportunity and platform. Um, and of course, um, to all of, of you, the audience, um, our special guest, panelists, interpreters and IT support team um, for your time and, and insight. <clears throat> In today's session, we will be discussing the legal obligations of states to protect the rights of the LGBTQI and gender diverse persons. My name is Larato Muloko Mpatele, chairperson of the legal and policy subcommittee of the seven South African Union of Students, and I'll be your moderator for today. Some context, um, the LGBTI and gender diverse persons rights in most African states are still illegal, not recognized and punishable by law. Despite the universal declarations of human rights and the African charter on human and people's rights, also known as the Bunjual um, Charter, Resolution 275, adopted by the African Commissions on Human and People's Rights, amongst others, uh, other many African states continue to pass bills and have laws that infringe on and violate the human rights of LGBTQI and gender diverse persons. Um, in this regard, I would like to, to take this opportunity to introduce a special guest, Barista and Chairperson Alison Kom. Chairperson Kom was the first woman to become part of the Bar Association in Cameroon. She is well known for her human rights work pertaining to the promotion and protection of LGBT and other sexual and gender minorities in Cameroon. In 2003, for example, she founded the Association for Defense of Homosexuality. Um, Chairperson Ngom has received several awards, such as the seventh Human Rights Award by the, um, by the German um, section of Amnesty International in 2014, the Central African Shield Award by the Pan-African Human Rights Defend Defenders Network in 2015, and the French Liberty Prize in 2018. Despite the death threats and other forms of intimidation, she has vowed to continue as a human rights defender in Cameroon. I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome Chairperson Ngom and once again, thank you for availing your, yourself to come and share with us today. Over to you. Homosexualité is devenu a délit par une ordonnance du President de la République du 28 September 1972, condamnant à, de six mois à cinq plus une amende de 20 000 à 200 000 francs, toute personne ayant une relation sexuelle avec une personne de même sexe. Il s'agit là d'une grave atteinte au principe sacro-saint de la séparation des pouvoirs, sans lequel le Cameroun ne serait plus une république, mais une vaste autocratie. Car il faut le dire, le code pénal est une loi votée par le Parlement, à qui la Constitution attribue l'exclusivité dans la détermination des crimes et des délits. C'est le lieu ici de rappeler que le premier code pénal adopté par le Cameroun nouvellement indépendant en 1965, dont les députés étaient tous issus des terroirs les plus reculés, sans téléphone, sans télévision, ont estimé que l'homosexualité n'était pas nuisible à la société. Car à cette même époque, dans les pays occidentaux, l'homosexualité était sévèrement punie par les lois et les homosexuels étaient obligés de se cacher ou de se suicider. Du coup, il est difficile de soutenir que l'homosexualité n'est pas africaine, mais importée, alors que l'Afrique est le berceau de l'humanité. Il porte à croire donc que c'est la pénalisation de l'homosexualité qui est une pure importation occidentale. L'article 347.1 du nouveau Code pénal du Cameroun doit être supprimé. Il viole la Constitution et il viole même l'article 2 du Code pénal. Il donne du Cameroun le visage hideux d'un État barbare qui ne respecte pas ses engagements internationaux. La Cour suprême du Cameroun a décidé dans son arrêt au Maïs Kassim que le juge national doit écarter une loi devenue caduque pour faire respecter les engagements qui s'imposent à l'État qui a ratifié une convention internationale. Mon combat, je l'ai commencé à partir des regards portés sur moi par quatre jeunes homosexuels venus me rendre visite dans mon cabinet dans les années 2000. 
J'ai vu dans leur regard, alors que je venais de leur annoncer que l'homosexualité était un délit au Cameroun, où ils étaient venus passer leurs vacances en provenance de Paris. Oui, j'ai vu dans leur regard une humanité blessée, une humanité qui m'accusait pour ce mur de séparation invisible entre les hommes. Et je me suis dit à moi-même, à cet instant-là, stop. L'homosexualité ne passera pas par moi. Au contraire, je serai dans les rangs de ces combattants. Et une militante dévouée pour la dépénalisation de l'homosexualité au Cameroun. J'ai engagé l'avocat que je suis dans l'association que j'ai créée à défaut pour défendre les droits humains des personnes LGBTQI+, pour le restant de ma vie. J'ai ainsi pu faire connaître dans le monde entier qu'il existait au Cameroun un grave problème pour les LGBT du Cameroun, en défendant, en médiatisant les, pro les procès, mettant en exergue l'homophobie d'État au Cameroun. Mes cris et la détresse des homosexuels ont été entendus et connus par le monde entier. C'est le lieu ici pour moi de remercier l'Union européenne et la section allemande d'Amnesty qui ont répondu en m'apportant l'appui financier et la visibilité dont j'avais besoin pour renforcer les capacités de riposte de, à défaut dans ce secteur et réduire les arrestations et les violences consécutives à cet apartheid homophobe. Aujourd'hui, et malgré quelques succès connus depuis le début de nos croisades, nous avons plus que jamais besoin de vous pour que les trans et autres ne soient plus arrêtés, condamnés, à l'instar de Shakiro et Patricia, qui purgent depuis le 8 février 2021 une lourde peine de cinq ans d'emprisonnement, ainsi que diverses amendes, et que nous devons impérativement sortir de cet enfer carcéral où elles n'auraient jamais dû se retrouver, afin qu'elle bénéficie d'une mise en liberté provisoire devant la Cour d'appel et dans les délais les plus brefs. Nous sommes honorés, encouragés de voir des personnalités de plus haut niveau dans le monde, comme les prix Nobel Barack Obama, Desmond Tutu et d'autres, prendre position en faveur de la dépénalisation universelle de l'homosexualité. Le président américain Joe Biden a traduit dans les faits et envoyé au Cameroun pays qui criminalise l'homosexualité, un ambassadeur uni dans les liens d'un mariage homosexuel en ne prenant en compte que ses grandes qualités de grand diplomate. Nous souhaitons un chaleureux welcome à cet ambassadeur et nous ne doutons pas que son séjour au Cameroun va marquer un tournant décisif dans notre combat en faveur de la dépénalisation, en boitant le pas à notre voisin immédiat, le Gabon. Ensemble pour ce combat qui est le nôtre et celui de l'humanité tout entière. C'est ensemble que nous allons mettre un terme aux violations des droits de l'homme dans les pays réfractaires au respect de la dignité humaine. We will never, never give up. Thank you very much, um, Chairperson Com, for that presentation. Um, I would like to um, thank you also for the work that you and your colleagues continue to, to do and achieve in, in you know, the LGBTI fight in Cameroon. So thank you very much, Mama Alice. <clears throat> um, we will move right along into our panel discussion um, with our three panelists, namely Portia Comencia, Ellen, um, Augusta Ondave Ayaku, and James Katlejo Chibamba. They are the co-authors of an April 2021 paper, Absolute Sovereignty Exceptions, as well as Legal Obligations of States to Protect the Rights of LGBTQI and Gender Diverse Persons. This paper was published in the Harvard Kennedy School LGBTQ um, Policy Journal. And I'd like to take this moment to note here that Sean Mugisha, the fourth co-author, sends his apologies for missing this discourse. Um, I would like to give the, my fellow panelists um, the opportunity to highlight some of the points um, from the paper that they've co-authored. Um, Portia, Augusta, and Katleho, over to you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I just want to give a big thank you to Mama Alice. Thank you for your wisdom and your knowledge. 
I, I think um, what I would say in about 60, 60 seconds, um, I'm mindful of the time, is that the premise of our paper is to critique the notion that states' absolute sovereignty um, cannot be challenged. So actually it can. And in our paper, we reference George Mukindi Wachira's point in sovereignty in the United States of Africa, insights from European Union, where Wachira mentions that in terms of the African Union Constitutive Act, there are various organs with diverse competencies which have been established and whose effective execution is dependent on states transferring some of their sovereign powers to those bodies. And then I also want to just um, give a pause to note that when we talk about this international system that we're in, it's very much built on a patriarchal, high, hierarchical um, mode. So that can also be um, challenged. For example, Fohan Lee says that she specifies that queer scholarship does not simply target the international human rights regime. It delves into the fundal premise of international law. Thank you very much, Uga. Um... Portia, over to Augusta, then followed by Katleho. Um, Thank you very much, Lerato. Just to take it off from where um, Portia, from what Portia has said, I highlighted uh, the Nigerian context, looking at um, some of the laws that exist in Nigeria that actually violates the equality clause that we have both in Nigerian law and also the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Um, and as such, you know, Nigeria being a party to international and um, regional uh, human rights treaties must ensure that it addresses this rising trends uh, on violence and discrimination against LGBTQI and gender diverse persons. Thank you. Thank you, Portia. And I'll just hand over to Kashiavo. Thank you, Lerato, as well as to the Copenhagen 2021 team for this opportunity. You will agree with me, Lerato, and all, that the South African constitution remains amongst the most progressive in the world. However, the South African context of our paper advocates for the reformation of the Alteration of Sex, Description and Sex Status Act 49 of 2003. The reason for this is that trans and intersex people are faced with limitation in accessing legal gender recognition. This is because access is still pathologized. There are barriers that many transgender and intersex people face in order to obtain legal gender recognition in South Africa. Some of these barriers include having limited access to gender affirming surgery and hormonal therapy. This is a huge challenge, especially given the fact that there are only few hospitals that provide gender affirming surgeries and treatment as well as hormonal therapy. Thank you very much for those opening remarks. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to delve into um, my first question of asking, what are some of the existing laws passed by Nigeria, South Africa, and Uganda that directly and indirectly violate the human rights of the LGBTQI and gender diverse persons? Um, I would start with Augusta, um, followed by Kaleho and Portia. Okay, uh, thank you once again, Lerato. So um, Nigeria, I think the most prominent law that actually exists as the same sex marriage prohibition act which was actually passed on, which was passed in january um in 2014 um but prior to the the passage of the same sex marriage prohibition act we actually had um the criminal code act which particularly in section 214 um which talked about carnal knowledge against the order of nature which uh, also criminalizes and uh, this carnal knowledge um uh, and then uh, gives a penalty of 14 years imprisonment. And uh, this same law has another section, um, section 215, which also criminalizes uh, the attempt to commit the offense prohibited in section 215. Now that section 214 actually uh, refers to, or applies to sexual intercourse between men. Um, section 217 of the same criminal code act also prohibits, um, acts of gross indecency between men or the procurement or attempted procurement uh, with a penalty of about three years. 
Then we also have the Sharia law. Uh, the Sharia law is actually uh, in the 12 northern states of Nigeria, and it actually criminalizes same-sex intimacy between both men and women. So that's what we have in Nigeria. Well, th thank you very much for, for that, um, Augusta. I would like to then just move to South Africa um, through Katsiaho. Thank you. So in South Africa, we, we have the Alteration of Sex and uh, Description and Sex Status Act 49, which is a law enacted in the constitution of South Africa. This law gives access to trans, gives trans and intersex people access to accessing, uh, ability to access a uh, legal gender recognition by applying to the Department of Home Affairs. In that regard, they would then be able to, uh, to, to have their legal documents assigned with their assigned gender. However, the limitations to this is that the act in itself, it's still very pathological in nature in that before a trans or an intersex person can be approved to have their sex assigned, um, uh, their, le their legal gender recognition assigned, they still need to undergo some medical procedures and you know some psychological procedures, and in this regard, they are unable to uh, to have to have their to have their uh, sex assigned without having undergone these things. And noting the fact that there are limitations in being able to meet some of those requirements, that's why we are advocating for the reformation of this act to be uh, depathological in nature. And in that, South Africa. Uh, is signatory to a number of you know, international uh, declaration, one of those being the Yogyakarta principles, as well as the international best practice for changing gender markers uh, in, 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 in identity documents. We note that there are you know, some several changes that have been made. For example, in 2019, the World Health Organization depathologized you know, the trans identity. So it is the responsibility of states to ensure that they, are, they have their constitution aligned to some of these international treaties and signatories that they have put themselves into. And it is on this basis that we say, yes, the law is there. In fact, the act is there that recognizes this, but it needs to be reformed so that it can speak to the issues of the day. I will leave it there for now. Um, thank you very much, Katloro. Um, before I, I come back to you, Katloro, I would like to just go back to Augusta and ask her if she may just expound on how Nigeria's national sovereignty can be challenged um, in terms of where it is, where, yeah, I think where it can be legally documented that Nigeria government continues to fail to protect its citizens who identify as LGBTQI and gender diverse persons. Um, over to you, Augusta. Thank you, Lerato. So um, how can Nigeria's sovereignty be challenged? Now, we actually have um, violations being documented in Nigeria. So there are several that can actually um, put Nigeria on the spotlight. And that's why we're having this conversation. Now, to challenge the sovereignty, the most important thing or the, what, what the step or the strategy that stands out mostly is true litigation. Now, it could either be litigation within um, the courts in Nigeria or the regional courts or the international courts. Now, with, in Nigeria, the, the courts are actually, um, they actually shy away from handling cases that have to do with LGBTQ and gender diverse, um, other gender diverse persons. And it's as a result of you know, the cultural and religious um, beliefs of most Nigerians and even the judges, most of them they are unable to um, separate themselves from that. Now, we've had cases that have been uh, litigated before the courts in Nigeria, but, and, and it actually states that rights have been violated, but it doesn't go further to, to recognize that the right of an LGBTQI or gender diverse person has been um, violated. So the issues that are looked at is just basic rights in the constitution, but why the violation occurs, the court has never tried to look at that. And even um, challenging the laws, the Same-Sex Marriage Prohibition Act um, 
uh, up to date is still being challenged in court through strategic litigation. We've come through various angles to trying to register um, lesbian and gay associations uh, and the Register General of um, the Corporate Affairs Commission refuses to register because it's, it's against public morals because it says lesbians equality initiative. And so they don't want to see the word lesbian in it. Now, such a case was taken to court and the court threw out the case because they said, yes, it has, the name actually uh, corrupts public morals. So that's the problem we have um, in the courts in Nigeria. However, um, there is also another way, apart from going on full litigation, we actually try to um, challenge the sovereignty by true strategic litigation. Now, strategic litigation actually calls for more like um, judicial activism. You go before, the, we take these issues before the court. We have people like, um, we can bring um, Amicus Curie. The Amicus Curie is like the friend of the court to actually um, talk to the judges, to educate them on the, on the, on the issues that have to do with the violations and discriminations on LGBTQ and gender diverse, LGBTQI and other gender diverse persons. So uh, these are the methods that have been used within uh, Nigeria to challenge the sovereignty, to make sure uh, to the sovereignty of Nigeria, to make sure that uh, the rights of LGBTQI and other gender diverse persons are uh, recognized. And also through the regional courts, like the ECOWAS court or the, um, the African Court of Human and People's Rights, you know, we have cases of violations being documented. So it is not if we do, but the challenges, the challenges that we have within and even at the regional court where we get pronouncements at the regional courts, it's the implementation that becomes an issue even in Nigeria. However, um, what it takes now most times is it's about, um, like lobbying or trying to understand how the system works, trying to talk to policymakers. When we have such judgments from the regional courts or international courts, we haven't really had any from the international court, but from the regional court where we try to um, influence policymakers, legislators, you know, um, on why these laws should be decriminalized and why it is really necessary for the rights of um, LGBTQI and gender diverse persons to be recognized in Nigeria. So that is how, so far, um, the sovereignty of Nigeria has been challenged and it can be challenged at any point in time. Um, thank you very much, Augusta, for, for that, that expoundment um, in, into the questions that I've asked. Um, I would want to move back to Katleho, um, <clears throat> understanding that South Africa is actually quite a progress has a pro progressive constitution. I would like for Katia to just um, ex um, elaborate um, about possible reform measures in South Africa as it relates to the alteration of sex description um, and sex status at um, 49. Thank you, Lerato. The reason the Act 49 should be reformed is to make provision for transgender, diverse and intersex minors, asylum seekers and refugees to have their gender identity recognized, all of whom are extremely vulnerable and marginalized groups currently being excluded from accessing the rights to gender recognition, thereby bearing their access to legal gender recognition and other human rights services. This would entail you know, removing the acts currently highly uh, exclusionary medical requirements and replacing it with gender self-determination model that allows people to change their legal gender marker through uh, self-declaring and gender identity in a simple and quick administrative procedure with the option of leaving gender unspecified or blank should an individual wish to do so. This will result in significantly more trans and gender diverse persons being able to obtain legal gender recognition and will make the provisions for persons whose gender identity is non-binary or fluid, or who do not wish to have specified gender assigned to their own safety. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, um, Kashiako, for the, that response. Um, I would like to move over to Portia. Um, in part of the paper that you guys have published, um, you provide um, a five, five strategies, um, strategies in, in your paper. Um, and I would like to ask, are these just um, a wish list of sort? Or May you just outline these strategies for us, um, Portia? 
Um, thank you. I'm going to keep my video off. I'm, I'm experiencing some technical, um, some technical difficulties, and I'll try to put my video back on in a bit. But for now, I hope y'all can hear me, okay? You were talking about um, the five strategies, and you're right. They are, they're definitely a wish list. That's for certain. But I think when we talk about wish lists, we should have that. And at the same time, they're quite practical. So let me just wrap them up in, in brief to, to say um, why, we, why we're talking about these five strategies. When we wrote our paper, we didn't just wanna have a paper that talked about the problems. We wanted to actually have strategies in the paper that were practical. So wish list, yes, and at the same time, they can be implemented. So one possible strategy is to achieve economic strength through the affluence and influence within the African continental free trade area. Another suggestion is a type of mobilizing that's not dependent on the high or, or what I call patriarchal and pardon for that mispronunciation leadership models. A third strategy includes lobbying allies to intervene where it can be legally proven that states are violating human rights. A fourth strategy is continuing to obtain credible data to further authenticate the human rights and justice. In this case, in our paper, Nigeria, South Africa, and Uganda, those injustices against LGBTQI and gender diverse persons. A suggested fifth strategy is to coordinate with equally significant movements aiming to achieve human rights particularly around economic justice in Nigeria, South Africa, and Uganda. I wanna say this, but, and I know I may be over time, is a lot of times one of the strategies where movements are not successful, because we're great, obviously, in identifying the problem and protesting, and I wanna give respect to those spaces. After the protest, the follow-up, so when we can join together and we can do that follow-up and it's coordinated, I think we'll have better chances of consistent implementation. Let me stop there and thank y'all. Um, thank you very much, Portia, for that. Um, and it echoes the same sentiments that um, um, Augusta has said is that we need more implementation. And moving right into that space, um, <clears throat> Katlero and Augusta as lawyers, um, I would like to ask those questions of how do we as Africans and in terms of the legislature and judiciary levels um, in our respective countries, um, hold to account our governments who have discriminatory laws um, against LGBTIQ, DQI, and gender diverse persons. Over to the two of you. Just to pick up from where I said, we can't just have litigation as the only way to hold our states accountable. Uh, litigation is just one of the way, but I think the, the best, another option is advocacy. Advocacy on, on these issues, on, on these laws, on how it affects um, the, the LGBTQI um, community. Um, looking at the policies that we have on ground, looking at um, pronouncement, how do we get this? How do we speak directly to the ear of the government? So advocacy is key. One litigation, litigation, strategic litigation, we, we're, we're trying to test the law, to challenge the law, also advocacy, because um, we can't just go to the courtrooms and try to get pronouncements, and then you come to the issue of implementation and then you're stuck. So uh, the multi-level advocacy from the grassroots to the, to the top tier of government, we need to know how these policies, whether it's, um, looking at resolutions, trying to look at foreign pronouncements. We need to bring Nigeria on board to understand that the world is moving forward. And having this violation and discrimination against um, the LGBTQI community only puts us way behind when it comes to progression. Our sovereign nations are progressing and it doesn't really tell well for us. So um, we... I know in Nigeria, when we look at it, we have law, we have signed treaties, international, regional, and even our constitution makes it, um, makes um, actually states that, you know, the rights of all citizens will be, will be upheld and, and recognized, but 
we have to be particular about the rights of the LGBTQI persons in Nigeria. So it's really, it's really, really important that um, apart from litigation, we're able to carry out high level advocacy um, for some of these issues. We can't have Nigeria sign these treaties and at the same time contradict itself with laws like the Same Sex Marriage Prohibition Act and discriminating against people based on their perceived or real sexual orientation is very, is very contradictory. You can't have Nigeria have a ratify the Anti-Torture Act and we still have gross violations against the LGBTQI facing torture and on you know, inhuman and degrading treatment. So um, that's how I think that we can you know, challenge it the legislature and the government and hold them accountable. Um, thank you very much, um, Augusta. Um, moving right along to Katlenko, what's, what's your views? What's your comment? Thank you, Lerato. I think testing the courts through litigation, specifically strategic litigation, is one of the tools that should continue to be used. Civil society organizations, activists, international human rights bodies should continue to also put pressure into governments to ensure that the human rights are upheld. Uh, in the South African context, we have three institutions. I mean, through the th separation of powers, we have the legislature, which is led through the parliament, which sole responsibility is to ensure that laws are passed, laws are made, and, and especially laws that are in relation to the protection of human rights should be enacted. And then we have the judiciary, which should remain impartial at all times. When people come and test the courts through litigation, they should also ensure that you know, they pass on to judgments and when necessary, th take some of those laws and return them back to, to parliament to ensuring that further development and further um, uh, negotiations or, or, or debates should be implemented or when necessary, you know, some of these laws should be reviewed or reformed. Uh, and on that basis, I mean, the government through the, 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 the cabinet, their sole responsibility is to ensure that they enact and they implement some of these laws that have been passed through. And which means that they need to be uh, included within the national budget so that, you know, we don't have instances, for, 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 for example, the <clears throat> Act 49, where the act is there, but it is limited and it's inaccessible to those who are supposed to be benefiting from it. Uh, I will leave it there, Flora. Thank you. Uh, no, thank you very much, um, Augusta and Katlero. Indeed, we all stakeholders within um, a country has a role to play um, in you know, advancing all these issues. Um, I would <clears throat> like to move right along to Portia and Katlero. Um, my question is to kindly speak on what has occurred to date in South Africa in terms of the hate crimes bill um, and in Uganda in terms of the sexual offense offenses bill. Um, I'll start with um, Portia. Uh, thank y'all. Y'all gonna see my finger pointing because I'm using my phone. So just please pardon me. When we have challenges in life, we don't just sit and, you know, say, oh, the challenges, we just, we work with what we got. So that's what I'm doing. I'm working with my phone. So you might see it up and down a bit, but please know that I just want to continue this discourse. So Uganda with the sexual um, offenses bill, as we know, the Ugandan parliament did sign it. And of course, Sean Mogisha, who could not be here, if he were here, he would definitely be the voice that I would listen to to speak in this regard. What I'm hearing in the chatter with the human rights activists that I know who are on the ground, the bill is kind of, um, pardon me, not kind of, the bill is trying to attempt to say, hey, we're going to criminalize same-sex sexual activity under the guise of protection. And we've seen that before. It has happened in the USA. We're going to make this law and this law is to protect, but really it's actually to harm. So um, right now, again, what I hear on the ground from the human rights activists, I know there, it's, it's not likely President Museveni will sign this bill into law. Still, it, it, um, it, it's, it's there and it's dangerous just being there. We already know what's happening in Ghana. 
again, another introducing of a bill. And you, you really, um, if you think about the context, and I know it's a different context over in the United States of America, we had bills that were placed and passed and then signed into law and they're harmful. The bill process is harmful as well as the law process. So I think, again, talking about, not just talking about the problem, what we can do is there has been chatter already about it being passed by the Ugandan parliament. Now that it's sitting on President Museveni's desk and he actually could use a pen, he could actually use a pen to sign this into law. What are we doing throughout the world globally so that we cannot even have him sign it into law? So this is where I go back to those strategies about us being coordinated. And just because even if I'm not on the same agenda, so maybe I'm talking about human rights, maybe you're talking about agriculture, maybe somebody else is talking about education. At the end of the day, how do we connect and we further ourselves, our places in this world? Because we've seen with so many past events, so many past times, so many horrific examples of where we, where, where we harm, where we abuse, where we ostracize, where we reject, how that doesn't make us a better society, that actually makes us a, a harmful society. And we don't want that. I'll stop there. All right. So the, the, in South Africa, the hate crimes bill is currently before the National Assembly of Parliament. And, and I'm glad that you brought this, up because, brought this up because since the beginning of this year, South Africa has been met with the resurgence of hate crimes. Many LGBTI and gender diverse people have been violated and killed simply on the basis of their perceived sexual orientation and gender identity. And more said, there has been a lack of action from our government as well as our, uh, our parliament. To date, the hate crimes bill, which is aimed at reducing offensive hate speech and curbing the hate crimes in South Africa, has still not been passed through parliament since it was introduced and approved by cabinet in 2018 and taken to parliament in the same year. What the bill commits to do is that it commits the authorities to collect and report details about hate incidences and for effective monitoring analysis of trends and interventions and to provide quantitative as well as qualitative data on hate crimes. Once this law is made, it will allow judges to consider prejudice, biases, or even intolerance as on the basis of gender and sexual orientation among others in a crime as an aggravating factor in the sentencing of perpetrators. So it is really important that we need to ensure that we continue pushing the parliament, uh, our parliament to pass on the, the bill Thank you. Uh, well, thank you very much to, to both of your responses. Um, I would want you to, to, to go to Augusta um, and re referencing to the current um, you know, environmental con um, issues that are, are happening on the ground in Nigeria with the SARS protests um, occurring. Um, <clears throat> what are the, critics, um, the critics are saying that government's response has been to use police force and police brutality uh, brutality. Um, in the context of these protests, uh, may you inform us about um, the voice of the LGBTQI and gender diverse persons um, finding resonance in, in these protests? Okay, so yes, um, the critics, I, I, also, I think I agree with um, what the critics say, the Nigerian government using um, violence to rest as a response to protest, it's it's quite condemnable. Now, if the LGBTQI voices are being heard, no, um, I will give a, uh, a a practical example, a real example with what happened during the NSAS protest. And when the LGBTQI um, came out to also say, no, our rights are also being violated. We found other citizens telling them, look, go back to your home. Your problem is not our problem. So it, it, it just goes right back to the beginning that most people don't recognize that the problem with the LGBTQ, LGBTQI community, excuse me, 
is actually a, an actual problem in Nigeria. So no, when it comes to protest, um, and it, it, the LGBTQI community doesn't stand out because Nigerians are not ready to have that conversation. Um, Catalego, um, I know you want to come in, but Augusta, I wanted to say something right quick um, before Catalego comes in, and I'm cognizant of the time. It's interesting how I was just talking with a friend today. He's a white man, middle aged like myself. And when I talk about his policies or his politics, they're very different from mine. We're friends. And I was saying to him, you know, when you think about how there is a small concentration of economic wealth with less than how many percent of the population, it's debatable, but it's definitely not more than 5%. And I was saying, you know, you and I aren't supposed to be friends because you're supposed to get mad at me because I'm a black woman who's, who's dealing with, who's on the affirmative action or post affirmative action. And then I'm supposed to be mad at you because you're a white man who has did whatever. So isn't that interesting how, when we are fighting for causes, we fight for the causes. And I'm saying this in general as people and, and, and just past events, when we're fighting for these causes, we start only holding them for ourselves, like what we're gonna get out of it. I think what's strategic is what can most of us get out of it. This is why I like the law and I know I'm not a lawyer. What, how beneficial can the law be to be the most human rights? So when you were talking about the protests with SARS that happened, it was interesting whether I even heard one person say, why don't LGBTQI and gender diverse persons get their own thing? Can you imagine when what we're talking about is police brutality in Nigeria? Doesn't that affect all of us? I'll stop there. I see Augusta nodding her head. Okay, so I think, uh... I'm not sure if I would be following through if there was a question asked when 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 I got disconnected, but I'm just gonna go on 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 on, on my my take on specifically the the hate crimes bill uh, that I feel in its I mean I indicated that it needs to be passed, you know. Uh, however, we understand that reviving the bill before Parliament is quite simply not enough. It needs to be processed and passed into law with budget allocations for its meaningful enactment and implementation. And simply failure to do so is failure to protect some of the most vulnerable people uh, in South Africa. Equally so should be the case in reforming the alteration of sex at, uh, uh, description act 49 of 2003, so that it removes some of these exclusionary matters that uh, 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 trans as well as intersex people are facing. I mean, pathologizing still in 2021, really that should be something that countries alone should be able to look into and to ensure that they at least align themselves with the health, uh, with their international uh, 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 signatories, especially that being the, the World Health Organization. Um, you know, it has it has led by by example by depathologizing uh, the trans identity, and it's it's simply not such a difficult task that in country uh, we are able to you know shape some of our laws to make sure that they speak to this to the to the to the world. Well, thank you very much for for those topical engagement and and responses. Um, in wrapping up, um, I would like to give each and every panelist an opportunity. Um, to share the closing um, remarks um, on the paper and, of course, um, on LGBTQI uh, and gender diverse um, issues um, in the African diaspora. Um, I'll start off with Portia, followed by Augusta, and closing remarks by. Uh, thank you. I would just say, as a Black, middle aged, heterosexual, odd, strange, and all kinds of other additional positives that when I am looking at movements that are focusing on human rights justice, 
I'm not looking at why we're so different, even though obviously we celebrate our differences. So when we wrote this paper, if you look at Augusta, Catalego, and Sean and I, we didn't even know each other before we wrote this paper. We met, we met at um, a course and we said, how can we contribute to furthering human rights on the continent of Africa? We didn't look at what were we were we qualified or and when I say qualified, did we have a, a PhD or did were we on the latest TED talk? We were four distinct personalities who wanted to further human rights on the African continent. So what what can we do, not just talking to ourselves, but as a wider whole, have more Africans involved in LGBTQI and gender diverse human rights, which are all rights. And I can say that as a black middle aged heterosexual woman who was born in the United States of America. So cliche as it may sound, what connects us rather than separates us on the continent of Africa? And then how do we use those laws that have already been signed with those great ceremonies to hold the states to account? Thank you. Thank you, Leratu. Um, so in closing, I just want to restate uh, what, I said, what I said earlier. Um, Nigeria has these laws that are discriminatory, the Same Sex Marriage Prohibition Act, the Communal Code Act, the Sharia laws of the 12 Northern states. And these laws actually um, violate the equality clauses of both um, the Nigerian law and the Declar Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And Nigeria is a party to international and regional uh, human rights treaties. And, and as such, they should ensure to address um, the rising trend on violence and discrimination against persons based on their perceived or real sexual orientation or, or gender identity. So um, the, uh, we have to hold the state accountable. The Nigerian must demonstrate its commitment you know, to the universal right to equality by actually supporting um, a resolution that condemns discrimination on grounds of sexual orientation or gender identity. And I think that uh, with the work on ground, uh, we would actually get to the point where uh, people who identify as lesbian, gay, um, trans can actually move freely in Nigeria, uh, you know, and live without fear. So that, that, that's just my closing remark. Thank you. And Katiaho, your final words. So Lerato, um, across Africa, we understand and we know that uh, human rights, especially of uh, uh, sexual orientation, on, on the basis of sexual orientation and gender um, identity and expression have been violated. And several institutional tools in the form of government security forces and non-state armed groups have been, have been committing some of these human rights violations. So it is upon the government to ensure that they also come up with the same you know, tools and same institutions that are able to protect the rights of everyone. In the context of South Africa, we have the chapter nine institution in the form of the Human Rights Commission, the gender that in and, and the gender commission that ensures that our human rights as individuals are always upheld. So my take is we have all a collective responsibility. In the South African context, we have the chapter nine institutions, we have the civil society organizations, we have parliament, we have the judiciary, we have the state in the form of government, in the form of cabinet, to ensure that human rights are brought forward, are protected, and not a single person, especially anyone who identifies as LGBTI or as gender diverse in this country or even across uh, the continent to have their rights violated. It cannot happen. We have institutions that continue to serve the very government that we live in. We have you know, religious bodies, we have uh, traditional as well as cultural institutions that continue to perpetuate the narrative that you know, 
by virtue of your difference in being LGBTI or gender diverse, uh, you, you, you ought not to be a part of society. But we know that the law of every country, especially in this country of South Africa, we have the constitution which reigns supreme. So we cannot still be bullied and still have institutions that are continuing to violate the human rights of other people, that are continuing to perpetuate hate, that are continuing to ensure that they instill, even in the general society, the idea that by you, by virtue of being different in terms of your gender and your sexual orientation, that you ought not to be a part of society. So it is collectively our responsibility, but more so that of the government to ensure that protection is granted to every citizen, especially on the basis of their or uh, sexual orientation and gender identity and expression. Thank you. Thank you very much to my fellow panelists for um, you know, the, the very progressive engagement in enlightening us on some of these issues um, that we have on LGBTQI and gender diverse um, in, in Africa and, and you know, our sovereign states. Um, and I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you for the paper that you've published because through your work, we have through, of course, through uh, Copenhagen 2021, had the opportunity to share, um, you know, the context of what is happening in the African diaspora and in our various um, African states. Um, on my behalf, I, I, I thank you very much for the engagement. And once again, thank you to Copenhagen um, 2021 for the platform. Um, and I would say, you know, in South Africa, we say Aluta Continua. Uh, we're all humans um, and we all have um, rights. Um, no one has more superior rights than over anyone. Um, and as we, we continue to, to, to fight this criminalization and um, discrimination against LGBTQI and gender diverse uh, persons, um, I say let's continue. And um, thank you very much to the audience um, and Mama Alice Ngom for her, tr her brilliant work that she's done in Cameroon um, on human rights and um, you know, homosexuality uh, issues in, in Cameroon. Um, so with that, I'd like to say thank you very much. Um, bye. <laughs>